the outside of the shawl remains intact, but the inside's gone through a few transformations already. Yeah, they've just come. I think they've just finished converting it into flats now. It was a dance studio for a while. And before that, I think it was a school. The young yeah. rabbi there at the time, who to this day I'm very friendly with, was Rabbi Yisrael Fine. Indeed. For most of his career was in Southgate afterwards, yeah. Yeah, spent some time in Wembley. That's right, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we'll make, should we make a start? Whenever you're ready. Okay, I'll, so I'm supposed to spotlight me, whatever that means. And you'll mute everybody else while I'm talking. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Chapa, Diane Binstock, Rabbi Golko, on behalf of the Boreham Wood and Elstree United Synagogue and St. John's Wood United Synagogue, I welcome you to what promises to be a fascinating talk on the Hillman Windows by our guest this evening, Professor David Newman. I have to say that when Rabbi Chapa asked me to moderate this evening, I jumped at the opportunity as I have a very keen interest in social history through my own genealogical research, photographing of synagogue buildings and cemeteries, both old and new, I've carried out a fair amount of research into Anglo Jewry. The Hillman windows in my Shul in Boreham Wood have always been a, a fascination, and indeed, on more than one occasion, the inspiration to compose the new piece of music. Professor Newman grew up in North London, where his father, Rabbi Newman, was rabbi at the Dalston Synagogue, Poets Road, and in Barnet United Synagogue. Professor Newman made Aliyah with his wife Elaine in 1982 and lives in the southern community of Meitar. He has four married children living in Israel and six young grandchildren. Professor Newman holds the chair of geopolitics at Ben Gurion University, where he founded the Department of Politics and Government in 1997 the Center for European Studies in 2003, and was Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences from 2010 to 2016. From 1998 to 2014, he served as the editor of the International Journal of Geopolitics. His research and publications focus on political geography, borders and territor territorial politics, with a strong focus on the West Bank borders and settlements. Further, he has participated in talks relating to the potential Israeli-Palestinian peace arrangements. In recent years, he spent long periods of time on sabbatical in the UK, where he's been working on topics relating to the history of Anglo Jewry. In 2013, he received the OBE for promoting scientific and academic links between Israel and the UK. And in 2017, he was chosen as one of the 100 most influential British Olim in Israel. It's my, now my pleasure to invite Rabbi Newman to deliver oh. his talk. Uh, Professor Newman, to deliver his talk. There'll be an opportunity at the end to ask questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. I can just see that my father, whose yard site was just last week, would be turning over in his grave at the new title you gave me. I just gave you Samicha. Yeah, that's right, because uh, he and our family come from a long line of rabbis, but the only one piece of career advice he ever gave his children was not to go into the ministry. <laughs> Anything else was okay. But there's a good evening, everybody. It's really great to be with you speaking from the, in Meitar in the south of Israel, as Zoom technology allows us to do. And um, <coughs> it's, it's, I really appreciate being hosted both by the Boreham Wood United Synagogue and the synagogue that I when I am back in London and I've rented a small flat, I spend a lot of time in the St. John's Wood Synagogue where um, there is a most amazing collection of uh, David Hillman windows. And I'll be speaking generally about the Hillman windows tonight because a lot of them are similar um, across shawls. Um, but I'll be focusing particularly on Boreham Wood and on St. John's Wood. And as you can imagine for someone like myself who spent nearly 40 years in Israel, um, synagogue services are meant to be short for me um, and as much as I enjoy going to St John's Wood uh, they sometimes get a bit long and what I do towards the latter part is and people there know me for it I patrol the windows every week uh, when I'm there I look at a different window and examine it and always find something new. 
Um, you will have noticed that in the overlong uh, description uh, or obituary that Stephen gave me to begin this talk, um, there was nothing there which qualified me to speak about the Hillman windows, geopolitics, borders, and so on. Um, apart from maybe half a sentence where he mentioned the last few years, I've spent a lot of time back in London and been privileged to uh, work on some of the Jewish archives, which are held at the LMA in Farringdon. Uh, that's the depository of many of the Jewish institutional archives of, uh, of the UK, United Synagogue, the Bet Din, the Board of Deputies, the Office of the Chief Rabbi, and so on. Um, but on the side, I've always been interested in the David Hillman windows, both because of my interest in uh, synagogues and uh, the rabbinic history of England, and I have to come clean and say, because uh, David Hillman was my great uncle. Um, and therefore, I've always had a bit of an interest in his windows, not when I was a young man growing up in London, because on the whole, youngsters aren't interested in those sort of things. But when I first came to Israel, and I lived in Rechavia for three years, and I went to a shul called Renanim in Rechavia, um, where my cousins also went, and they said to me, they said to me, you know that uh, these are David Hillman windows. And I said, oh, are they? That's very interesting. And from that day on, I became very interested. And as you'll see over the next 40, 45 minutes, and um, what I'll do is I will divide my comments into three. Um, I want to spend the first 15 minutes talking about the social context of who was David Hillman and who was his family. Um, I'm very interested in the social and political context of 20th century rabbinate in England, particularly the first half century, where some very major figures, particularly Lithuanian figures, played a major role in the United Kingdom, um, from Rabbis Herzog and Untermann and Abramsky and Hillman and others. I find it very interesting. Um, and the Hillman windows are related to this because Hillman was related to these families. Um, so it's not just a question of art, it's a question of how his art intertwines with um, the, the family he comes from and the people he mixed with and his own knowledge. He himself had smich as a rabbi. His father, as we shall talk about in a minute, was Diana, the rabbi Shmuel Hillman, who was the head of the London based in for 20 years from around 1912 to around 1932, when he then went to live in Israel. Um, and um, so he had great knowledge. And this comes to play in the nature of his windows, which are very unique. Um, I'm very pleased in particular to be able to give this talk just when the United Synagogue is celebrating its uh, 150th anniversary, because I think that today the windows, the Hillman windows, which as we shall see in a minute, are to be found in no fewer than eight or nine United Synagogues spread throughout London, over 250 of them, are probably today the greatest single architectural heritage the United Synagogue has. It used to have beautiful cathedral synagogues, but of course, as the community has moved on over time from the center of the city to the suburbs, it has had to leave these beautiful shuls behind them with one or two exceptions, such as the New West End or the Hampstead in Dennington Park Road. But on the whole, these old beautiful cathedral synagogues have um, all but shut down. Some have unfortunately been destroyed. Some are now mosques, some are now churches. I myself in the 1960s grew up living, as they say, on top of the shop. My father was the last rabbi of the old Poets Row Dalston Synagogue, um, which was also one of these beautiful cathedral synagogues. It didn't have Hillman windows. And we actually lived in a flat on top of uh, the shawl in pre-gentrified Islington. If I was living there today, Jeremy Corbyn would be my MP. Um, and the windows, some of which have been built into the shawls that exist today, some of which, like Boreham Wood, and we'll speak about that, are in a, in a sense in their second usage. The Boreham Wood windows that uh, so many of you who are members of Boreham Wood see every week um, uh, when you come to the shawl were originally in the Bayswater shawl, which was knocked down in the 1960s. And after a short period... And after a short... Am I okay there? And after a short period of storage, they were uh, transported um, to Boreham Wood. There are a number of shawls that have done that. We'll go through the list. And the reason I opened my presentation with this window 
is because this is a window that should be in Boreham Wood. This particular window is from the Bayswater collection. But of all the windows that came from Bayswater to Boreham Wood, three never arrived. Um, <coughs> one of them, the one you see here, ended up in the stained glass window museum at Eli Cathedral, where last September I gave their annual lecture and it was the first time that anyone had ever given a lecture there on Jewish stained glass windows. Um, they have four Jewish windows amongst their very impressive collection there. How and why it actually got there, no one is really sure. Although one archivist um, uh, from the United Synagogue said that it is a bit strange that three of the Bayswater windows took a walk and never quite arrived maybe where they were meant to arrive. Um, but nevertheless, Boreham Wood received most of the Bayswater windows, and that's what you see in the shawl today. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So we're going to go through a PowerPoint I have. I'm not going to go through all the slides I have on the PowerPoint. There are far too many. <coughs> and I'll divide my comments into three parts. One to talk about Hillman and his family. One to talk about where the windows are to be found throughout London and also to say something very briefly about the art behind the windows. I'm not a professional artist, um, I'm not a critical artist, but I have um, uh, consulted with people who know art, who know um, synagogue art, who know stained glass windows, and um, I've walked around the windows with them, and every time they come for the first time to see this, they're tremendously impressed by what they see. Um, it's uh, not only is an architectural heritage, it's one of the best kept architectural heritage secrets in Great Britain. Um, and they tell me a few things about how these were made and what I should be looking at and so on. One of the first things you see looking at this Purim window in the Eli Cathedral is that it's a tremendously complicated piece of art. There is so much detail in it. There is food and there are words. And there, are, and there are all sorts of other things in it. And many people say that for them it's too complicated and that he should have uh, done things si more simply. That may or may not be the point. Nevertheless, it is a style. Anyone who knows the Hillman windows from any single shawl in London will immediately recognize them um, anywhere in London or anywhere in the world. There are a few places outside London as well uh, where these windows are to be found. Um, he has a very distinct style. It's very different to that which came before him, which was a sort of a more church-like uh, stained glass window, obviously with Jewish themes, but nevertheless more church-like and very different to a lot of the modernistic art you have in stained glass windows today. His is a very distinct style, and if you know his style, you can't mistake it wherever you go. So let's talk a bit about him. Um, David Hillman was born in Lithuania in 1894. Um, his father, from a well-known rabbinical family, was appointed to be the rabbi of Glasgow in 1908. He came with him, and uh, actually Hillman didn't stay a long time in Glasgow. In 1914, soon after Chief Rabbi Hertz was appointed to the job after the death of Chief Rabbi Adler, um, Hertz invited him to become the head of the Beth Din in London. He was only about seven or eight years altogether um, uh, in Glasgow, but as you can see, those were very formative years from the age of 14 to 20 when he was finishing school, when he was studying and beginning his art studies rather than yeshiva studies, which annoyed his father immensely at the time. Uh, when they did come to London for a very short time, he was the rabbi of the Sanders Row Synagogue, which, as some of you know, still functions very near Liverpool Street Station, just at the entrance to the Old East End. And in 1923, he married Annie Rabinowitz. Um, here comes my own personal interest. My grandparents were from the Rabbi Rabinowitz family. Um, you may have heard of Louis Rabinowitz. Uh, my grandmother was the oldest of that family, and one of her sisters, Annie Rabinowitz, married David Hillman in 1923. He resided for much of his life, later life, the 40s, 50s, when he was at the height of his art career in Priory Road, St. John's Wood. And I recollect as a young child that um, you know, we used to have to do that terrible thing, which meant going with our parents to our aunts and uncles for Sunday afternoon tea, very hard to get out of. And every so often, maybe three or four times a year, it would be at the Hillman's in Priory Road. And he would take us up 
to his attic, which was his studio, where he worked almost alone. And uh, we would look at the windows. We didn't appreciate them, as I say. I appreciate them much more today. Um, he died in 1974 and is buried in Bushy Cemetery. Um, he was both a young artist and a rabbi. And you see some pictures of him there as the young artist in uh, uh, the first uh, two decades of the previous century. His father, as I said, was Diane Shmuel Hillman from one of the really most prominent Lithuanian rabbinical families, who, as I say, had a very important career in England, both in Glasgow and then for 20 years in the London Beth Din. And um, uh, Diane Shmuel Hillman had two children. One was David Hillman, but his daughter actually married uh, Chief Rabbi Isaac Herzog, who, as you know, became uh, the rabbi. He grew up, actually, he was born in Lomja. He grew up in Leeds, where his father, Yoel Herzog, was a rabbi at the beginning of the century. Um, he then became a young rabbi in Belfast. For 20 years, he was the rabbi in Dublin and was in Ireland when Ireland became independent in 1921 um, and then became the chief rabbi of Ireland. And in 1935 or 36, a year after Rav Cook died in Israel, he was elected to be the chief rabbi of Palestine, as it was then, where he was from the mid 30s through to the late 50s when he died. In other words, he oversaw the independence of two new states. He was the rabbi in Dublin when Ireland became independent. And of course, he was the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel. Um, he spoke a fluent English. Uh, he was a great scholar. Um, and he was probably a, a very, uh, just the right sort of person to have there when Israel came into being. Uh, he is credited with the uh, prayer for the state of Israel that we, we say in synagogues in Israel, which increasingly is used in England. But as I say, he married Sarah Herzog, David Hillman's sister. And you can see this was the coming together of two very important Lithuanian rabbinical families, the Herzogs and the Hillmans. Um, it was quite common at that time for many of the Lithuanian rabbis who had come to Britain to marry their sons and daughters with each other. Um, so at the, at the generation of my grandparents, many were cousins or brothers-in-law or sisters-in-law, sometimes twice over. I think largely because they didn't trust, uh, let's say, the kashrut of the regular English Jews, and they relied on their own links to make their own shiduchim uh, with each other's families. As you can see, uh, it was considered a very important marriage when it took place. Uh, the wedding of Diane Hillman's only daughter to Rabbi Dr. I. Herzog, who was then already in Belfast. His father, and it, uh, what year? Did, I think his father would have left Leeds by then, would already have been in Paris. Uh, yes, right, chief rabbi of the Russian community in Paris. He went from Leeds to Paris after about 10 years. So this was a very important wedding which took place in the garden of the Beth Din or of Rabbi Hillman's house in London at the, the time. I put this picture on just out of interest because I say the Hillmans and the Herzogs, um, this is just a sort of a $64 million question. I'm not going to say I'm mute, but I often ask people, do you know who that boy in the middle in the white shirt is? Um, some of you may know, some of you may take a guess, but actually the boy in the white shirt in the middle is none other than the man who became President Chaim Herzog of Israel. He was born in Dublin, grew up in Dublin, and um, then, of course, later went with his father to, to Israel along with, and then the boy with the cap at the side of that picture is Chaim Herzog's younger brother, Yaakov Herzog, who actually was offered the position of chief rabbi in Britain in 1965 after uh, Chief Rabbi Brody retired. At uh, first he accepted, and then for health reasons, he turned it down, and it was then offered to Chief Rabbi Jakobowicz, um, uh, chief, another former chief rabbi of Ireland, of course, instead. So the Hillman the Herzogs have what you would say in the marriage market in certain circles, pretty good yichas, uh, both rabbinical and political and diplomatic and all around. Chaim Herzog has often said, has often written in his biographies, that during the Second World War, when he was also part of the time um, in the British Armed Forces, when he used to have leave or when he used to come and study, he used to come and stay with David Hillman, his uncle, um, in St. John's Wood, and he says that's where he had a love of opera. That's where he um, uh, grew to love opera, at David Hillman's house. So maybe not a typical Lithuanian rabbi's family, but I think that was more typical of that time than it may be of today. 
Um, as I say, he, um, he himself married Dr. Annie Rabinowitz, uh, who became a Hillman. And uh, we ha I've seen this invitation, the original of this invitation, in the US, in the archives of, um, in uh, the LMA. The LMA, by the way, are the London Metropolitan Archives, which are to be found in Farringdon Street. And any of you who are interested in family history, Jewish history, really need to go down there. It, it, there's some amazing records to be looked at there. The reason why this invitation is so interesting is because if any of you can make out, the addressee of the invitee is none other than Rav Cook. Rabbi Cook, who, as some of you know, was in England during part of the First World War when he'd come from Palestine. He couldn't get back when the war broke out. He was in Switzerland and eventually he came to London for three years and was the rabbi of the Masikir Das. And he obviously had strong connections with all of the rabbis, um, uh, particularly the Lithuanian rabbis like Hillman and Herzog and others at that time. <laughs> and so when Hillman and Rabinowitz got married, they invited him, but he didn't come to the wedding. Um, there's a nice, you know, th this is what went on. This was at an ultra-Orthodox wedding. If you look at the bigger pictures of the weddings, of every man, and many of the men had long beards, but they all wore top hats and tails. And uh, this was the wedding of David Hillman um, with a nice write-up, the week's wedding. This is not in a Jewish newspaper, outlining all the many guests there. I don't know if you can read, but you can see the chief rabbi Hertz was there and Diane Feldman and Diane Meldelson and Laz Diane Lazarus and Rabbi Herzog and a long list of very important rabbinical personalities. But the actual writing describes the lace and the taffeta of the dress that the bride was wearing at the time. Um, as I say, he was the son-in-law of Yaakov Rabinovich, which is also another well-known rabbinical family, but we'll skip that because that's a bit of an ego trip on my part. Um, he was also, and this is important where the windows come into play, he was also a childhood friend of Sir Isaac Wolfson because um, Isaac Wolfson grew up in Glasgow um, and they were about the same age and they must have been children and young teenagers at exactly the same time in Glasgow. Um, and that became very important as later on in his career, Wolfson paid uh, for some of his windows such as the Central Synagogue, which has a beautiful um, uh, set of his windows when it was rebuilt after World War II, it had been bombed. It was known as, uh, it was Isaac Wolfson's shawl, his local shawl. He paid for the rebuilding. It was then known for a long time as St. Isaac's. Um, and he paid for Hillman to do the windows there. He also paid for Hillman to do the windows in the Rananim shawl in Jerusalem, which for a long time served as the seat of the chief rabbinate, where Herzog again was there. So again, Glasgow, Herzog's, Hillman's, he also got derived some paranossa, not a great deal, as we shall see later, from the Wolfson connection, um, which, as I say, paid for some of these windows to be to be built. As you can see, a few of the windows, these are from the St. John's Wood, um, were de dedicated to Mr. and Mrs. Charles Wolfson, or by Mr. and Mrs. Charles Wolfson, um, in memory of uh, the father Solomon Wolfson, or the grandfather. Um, who is the father of Isaac Wolfson and who, the seat of the chief rabbinate, is actually named after Solomon Shlomo Wolfson because it was Isaac Wolfson that built um, the building in the first place. He was also the father of three very interesting characters, all very independent minded people. Ellis Hillman, maybe some of you would have known him. He was for a year or two the mayor of Barnet back in the 70s, 80s. He wrote, so he was a geologist, wrote a book called London Under London. Harold Hillman was a well-known professor of microbiology and Mickey Meyer Hillman, who is still alive today, living in Hampstead and has some original material of his father. Professor of architecture and town planning, looking up on the Google, you'll see he is a very major, what I would say, environmental guru in England. Um, you may not agree with all of his views on that, but uh, quite a character and um, he has, I've been to his house and he's some original material, unfinished material from his father uh, back to those days. Um, and that's the social context of who the family was. And I think it's very important to mention that because it says a lot about why he did this. And oh, I should make one more point and say that he was interested in art, but he also got smicha. 
And his father actually fell out with him. The dying fell out with him very badly when eventually he decided the rabbinate was not for him and he was going to continue only doing art. Um, now, the very earliest windows you'll find from Hillman are from the late 20s. But he'd already been an artist for some time. Um, and it is not clear, this is partly family mythology and the stories, that whether he was annoyed with him for doing art instead of the rabbinate is a possibility, but he started his art career by painting portraits. And it appears that his father was tremendously annoyed when he saw him painting nudes. He felt that this was not the right thing for a nice Jewish boy to be painting. Um, and it could well be that this fallout was one of the reasons why he did eventually take a turn towards synagogue uh, windows and synagogue art afterwards, but it's not clear. But they had a very bad, tense relationship, um, and they didn't have a great deal of contact once the Dayan, the father, had gone to Israel in the early 30s. Um, certainly not the sort of contact you would expect between a well-known father and a well-known son. There are a number of books out there where, you know, synagogue architecture of Britain um, can be seen. The Bible is Shaman Kaddish's huge work on the synagogues of Britain and Ireland, um, where there's also a page dedicated to the David Hillman windows. And there are two books, the, uh, the Lost Synagogues of London by Peter Renton, which I would love to do a second edition because that's already 25 years old. And there is many synagogues which have shut down but since then, as they have done, and the synagogues of London. Um, when just 10 years ago, nine years ago, last week, my father passed away and we were sitting shiver in Jerusalem in his flat. Um, that was one of the books out on the table, the Lost Synagogues of London. I think it became, certainly for a particular generation of people who were visiting the shiver at the time, it became the talking point of the week. Oh, that used to be my shawl. Oh, that's the picture of the rabbi who, you know, bar mitzvahed me, etc., etc. You can't get the Lost Synagogues of London for love of money. Go on eBay today, and if you can find a copy, they'll want £250 for it. Um, it's a great historical document of synagogues in London, um, and it's, uh, it's well worth a read. Um, and there's a lot of information there, of course, about the architecture and the shawls which have shut down. Where are the windows? As you can see from this list, they are throughout London. The largest <laughs> number of windows are to be found in St. John's Wood. They're not the largest windows. The biggest windows in terms of size are probably the ones at the central synagogue and also probably closely followed by the ones in your shawl in Boreham Wood um, uh, and so on. But most of the synagogues where he did the windows um, have, say, a set of 12 or a set of 15 at the most, depicting the festivals, depicting other Jewish events. There are, there are no other shul which has the number which is to be found in St. John's Wood. St. John's Wood is an interesting story because they were in the original windows in the original St. John's Wood shul, which, of course, is now the new London of the Masorati movement and Abbey Road. And the windows moved as the shawl moved in the 60s. It was the same time as the Jacobs affair, but that was not the reason the windows were taken. It would have been agreed that the windows would move. But the new shawl was so large that they needed more windows to complete the set. And so if you go into St. John's Wood today and you know what you're looking for, you will, can quite clearly see which are the original windows from the new London and which are the windows which were are done 20, 25 years later to complete the sets, and we'll have a look at them later. But as you can see, Egerton Road, which is now the Bob of Hasidim, whether they wanted to keep the windows or not, they had no choice because they were listed. It was a listed building. Um, and I've been in there once or twice, and I've taken groups walking around Stanford Hill. I originally grew up in that area. Um, <clears throat> and, um, <coughs> and actually, as I've been explaining to other people, to some of the Hasidim, some of the kids come up to listen, and they're very interested in the history of the, of the windows because they are very Jewish windows. They're very religious. They're very Jewish windows. Um, and uh, so they're still in the... It must be probably the only Hasidish base of Medrash anywhere in the world with such beautiful stained glass windows um, anywhere to be found. There's a set in Hampstead Garden suburb. There's a set in the central... Um, and as you can see, a number of shawls that closed down, Cricklewood from Warm Lane, or the Western Shawl in Crawford Place, 
or the New Cross South East London Shawl and the Bayswater Shawl, their windows were all transferred to newer shawls. So from Cricklewood, they went to Bronsbury and Hendon. Um, Bronsbury actually are very nice because they're lit up. They're the only ones that are lit anywhere. And the reason they're lit up is because they're not used as windows there. They're used on the wall. They're actually in storage at this very moment because you may know they're rebuilding the Bronsbury Shawl. Um, but, uh, and, and it would be great if some of the other sets were lit up because it's very hard actually to conduct the tour of the Hillman windows in the shawl itself. Because if you want to do it when there's light, then of course you have to do it during the day and not many people can come along. If you want to do it in the evening, um, when maybe more people can come along, they are not lit up. It's an expensive job to have them lit up. Um, but Bronsbury have them lit up because as I say, they're on a wall. Uh, Kenton, who got the windows from Crickwell, they're the only shawl in London where the windows are at the front of the shawl and not on the side. And if you're in there during a prayer service and you're facing the Aron Kodesh, the ark, and the sun is shining through from the front, it can be quite a, a, a spiritual experience to look at these windows um, surrounding the ark. But as I say, Kenton is the only place at the front. Marble Arch, they're not in the shawl itself. If you go there, you know that they have a gallery, the Hartog Gallery um, upstairs, which is where all the Hillman windows are to be found. Hampstead has two of the earlier windows. The Woodside Park windows were originally New Cross. Your windows and Boreham Wood, all but three of them came from Bayswater. Chelsea have a few, St Albans have a few, and I'm sure there are a couple here and there which I've missed them, which I've missed here and there. If you look very carefully in your own synagogue at Boreham Wood, you'll find that there's a bit of a problem. Actually, you don't see the bottom of the windows. Um, I don't know whether this was an architectural um, uh, foul up or whether it was decided later to bring the windows in. I don't know the history, but actually the bottom part of every window where his signature appears is actually hidden by the wall, by the concrete, which is a little bit unfortunate um, and so on. Uh, there are a few outside London uh, in late 20s. Some of, his <coughs> some of his first windows were in Leeds. There's a window in Terenure, Dublin, which was done, done long after Herzog left, which is a combination of his ideas. I said the Rananin shawl in the middle of Jerusalem opposite the, um, or right next to the uh, chief rabbinate, uh, right next to the King's Hotel. But as I say, that, that window in Eli Cathedral, which just seems out of place there, but is a great reason for going to visit. Um, when I gave the talk last year at the Eli Cathedral, a gentleman came up to me and said, I've always wanted to hear someone who knows about the Hillman windows because I am the editor of the Journal of Stained Glass. And a few years ago, I put in, um, I, and I used to work for what was called the Lounge and Drury Glass House. And I put in a list of all the windows that we ever um, put the glass together. Often the artists would arrange the glass. Sometimes they would put it together themselves in their own studios, but often they would go to a glass house who had the expertise and they would, um, I'm not quite sure what the technique is, they would put the pieces of glass together and heat the glass to the right temperature. And he produced, gave me a copy of this journal of stained glass. And there is almost a complete list of all the Hillman windows. It was an amazing discovery. I spoke to people at the United Synagogue they, um, they knew nothing about this at the time. And if you, I don't know if I can blow this up, but if you look, you can see Cricklewood, you can see their Bayswater, where it says Bayswater, these would be the windows which you now have in Boreham Wood. And at the bottom, you have some of the earlier St. John's Wood windows. And it also says how much it costs for each one to be done and what the theme was. And this is a tremendous record. It's not a complete record, I'm not sure that anyone, including the United Synagogue, has a complete record of all the windows, um, but it's the closest you will come to that. And um, I found that people didn't know about this, um, um, about this list, which is a very important uh, artifact in, for someone who's interested in this. Um, we'll go on through that. The Rananim Synagogue, there are lights, um, which you can see. When there are lights inside the shawl, you see them best from outside. So that's what it looks like there. Uh, Bet Knesset Hanasi in Jerusalem just has these two little windows, which are very similar to the two to be found in St. Albans. It's the famous story in Devarim in Deuteronomy about sending the mother bird away. 
one of the things you'll see in the windows, which I'll come to in a minute, was his amazing use of religious texts, be they from the Torah, from the Tanakh, from the Agadata, from the Gemara, from the prayer. He had a tremendous command of texts, and it was well known in the family that when he, someone would just mention a sentence to him anywhere in the whole Tanakh, and he could just recite by heart the whole of the paragraph, the whole of the chapter, and this was one of his favorite party tricks, and he um, had huge sources. You will not find this sort of use of text in any other Jewish stained glass windows anywhere. Again, some people will say it's too much, it's too crowded, but he has whole portions of the tefillah and of, of other Jewish texts in his windows. So that's uh, St. Albans. Uh, there are these few, I'm starting with the small sets and then moving up into the big sets. And um, I found these three in Chelsea. The middle one is strange because it's really not like a Hillman window, but it's definitely one of his. It was when I went to see these three windows about 18 months ago, I nearly ended up in a police cell because I had arranged to go and see them. I got there early, so I stood outside the little Chelsea shul taking pictures. And within about two minutes, there were two police cars there wanting to know what I was doing, taking pictures of a synagogue, and was I a potential terrorist, and so on. Luckily enough, the rabbi came along at that moment and vouched for me. Um, this is the one in Terenur, Dublin, where a few are put together, but you can see his themes there together at the bottom. And then um, we come to the central synagogue. It's the only place I've actually given the talk inside the shul itself. Um, and they're very majestic windows in the central synagogue. As I say, Sir, Sir Isaac Wolfson had them commissioned in the 1950s when the shul was rebuilt. They're the only windows which have curved roofs to them. Most of them are squares or oblongs, and here they have curves. So that's a very impressive collection in the central synagogue. Egerton Road, which is now the Bob of Hasidim, some of the earliest windows, you can see that they're much simpler. They have less text, but again, the major themes are the same themes. Uh, Western Marble Arch, the Hartog Gallery. Actually, if you were to look at them one by one, you'd see they're very similar to the Bayswater set, which are in Boreham Wood. Bronsbury Park, as I say, they were lit up because they were not windows, they were on the wall. And I assume they're going to have place of honor in the new shawl when the new shawl is uh, completed. If they don't, I have a lot of clients in Israel who would be love to have some Hillman windows in Israel. And I think it's very important, by the way, that the United Synagogue, you know, make good lists of these windows to ensure, obviously, shawls are going to open and close at different points in history. But I think it's tremendously important these sets are kept together and they move together if and when it ever becomes necessary. And if there is no need for them or desire for them in England, I can think of plenty of beautiful places in Israel which would uh, love to have David Hillman stained glass windows. That was a little promo. Um, so in Bronsbury Park, you have this plaque. The windows designed by David Hillman were donated by its members and originally installed at Cricklewood Synagogue between 31 and 57. And following the closure of the show in February 2005, they found funds to bring them to Bronsbury. This is what I was telling you about in Kenton, where it's the only shul where you have them at the front of the synagogue and not on the side. And you can see the light coming in there surrounding the Aron Kodesh. Woodside Park came from New Cross. Um, and again, there's a sign there, the stained glass windows in the synagogue are from Southeast London Synagogue. Woodside Park were very clever because um, Stephen, you told me you're from Sunderland. Well, their windows are from New Cross and their furniture is from the Sunderland Basin Medrash. So I think it's a very good way of recycling beautiful synagogue furniture and beautiful synagogue windows um, rather than having it destroyed as used to be the case in many synagogues, unfortunately. <coughs> and so the Woodside Park has both beautiful furniture and windows from other shawls. And then we come to your own shawl, Boreham Wood. Um, which I'm going to speak about a bit more. A bit more, as I say, the only unfortunate thing in Boreham Wood is they not the walls aren't deep enough to see the bottom of the windows themselves. Um, and the other shawl that I know so well, St John's Wood, where they, as I say, they have a downstairs and an upstairs. Um, I mean, you just can't get them all into one picture, um, and, and so on. So these are the two collections we'll talk about. But really, when I talk about these windows, we're talking about all of his windows. St. John's Wood has a history because um, he, as I say, he lived in that area. So, and he used to go to the St. John's Wood Synagogue when it was in Abbey Road and then um, for a very short while before he passed away um, in, um, Gro is it, what is it, Grove Road? Um, 
Uh, I know how to walk there, but I don't know what the name of the road is. Um, there are three windows there, actually very close to where I sit near the back, um, which were dedicated in the original Bayes, um, Abbey Road Synagogue to three important Zionist figures, Theodor Herzl, Chaim Weitz, and Mordechai Eliash, who you may remember was the first Israeli ambassador to Britain after the establishment of the state. The Zionist Federation sponsored or funded those particular three windows. Under each of the windows, one is, as you can see, dedicated to Chaim Weitz and one to Theodor Herzl and one to Dr. Mordechai Eliash. There was a booklet brought out. I found this booklet recently. When I say recently, I haven't been in England because of the corona for some months now. Out of all places in the British Library collection, it wasn't in the United Synagogue archives. It wasn't <laughs> in the Shul archives. And I just came across this by chance in the British Library where they put a book together of the initial windows when they were first dedicated um, with an order of service and then a two page, one a description and one some pictures um, of each of the major themes um, of the windows themselves. And then again, they were rededicated in the 1970s in the new St. John's Wood Shul. So they had another rededication. And these next few pictures, this and that, um, come from a small exhibition to be found on the stairwell in St. John's Wood Synagogue um, about the windows. You can see Chief Rabbi, um, uh, you can see on the right is a picture of the consecration in 54 with Chief Rabbi Brody at the front. Um, uh, of the crowd. And on the left, you can see um, uh, them being rededicated in St. John's Wood. Rabbi Cyril Harris is to be seen there at the back. Um, for those of you who remember him, he was the rabbi at St. John's Wood at the time. Um, and this was written about for a bit in the press because they were such beautiful windows and they came to the attention, not just of the Jewish journalists, but also of some of the art writers at the time. He didn't make a great deal of money out of his windows. You would think, you know, he was doing this by himself. One of the questions we always ask is, how did he manage to do a few hundred windows and near, did nearly all of the work from the design to putting the staying glass together, normally in his studio with one, as we used to laugh about, his slave. He had one worker who used to live and eat up there, which changed every so often. But he did nearly all of the work. By himself, his children told us that, you know, he used to go to synagogue in the morning, come home, have a cup of coffee, go up to his studio and come down for supper at eight o'clock in the evening. Meanwhile, his wife, Dr. Annie Hillman, was one of three Rabinowitz sisters of an Orthodox family who amazingly in the 1920s and 30s qualified um, as GPs and doctors. She went out to work and earned the living and he made the windows. And you can see he did get paid, but not a huge amount. Got to, for three large windows in St. John's Wood Synagogue, even allowing, obviously for inflation since then, um, he got was paid, I won't say a pittance, but not a huge amount of money. And he never made any large amounts of money out of his windows. I love this picture because it's in the other London Synagogue. It's the only book you will find where the two St. John's Wood Synagogues are pictured face opposite face. And those of you who have an interest in Anglo-Jewish history like I do and have a sense of irony will appreciate what it means to have those two synagogues looking at each other from the same pages on, on, on the book. And then we come to looking at the art of the windows and I'll spend the last 10 minutes uh, looking at uh, some of this. This is a typical set to be found in St. John's Wood. Um, at the bottom level, you have 10 sets of five windows, five on each side. The middle three of each set of five are from the original synagogue, and the outer two were done 20 or 25 years later. Most of the cases, the outer two were twin or mirror images, as you can see in this case, not in every case, but you can also see they were done slightly differently. They were much lighter. Um, and, uh, and if you were really in there and you were looking at them, then you would uh, appreciate that the style is slightly different. His style developed, his major themes didn't develop. If you look at the middle window, this is a Sukkot window. Uh, oh, sorry, this is a, every five is a set of one festival. So this is the five for Sukkot. If you look at the middle window of Sukkot or the middle window of Shavuot, and then you look at your windows in Boreham Wood and look at what is the Sukkot window? What is the Shavuot window? you will find that that is his main window. His main theme window is the one in the middle here. 
Um, some of them he adds text, some of them he doesn't add text. Some of them he adds embellishments as time moves on. But the basic theme he uses for each festival is the same. He also had to add top windows, as you can see. So really, this is really a set of 10. That's already 10 times 10. Um, and we're just a close in here. I'm going to come back to this. There's something to say about the use of images of people and the images of faces, which is not normally accepted in Orthodox synagogues. And there is a, a booklet which came out called The 100 Best Stained Glass Sites in London, uh, which includes four Jewish sites. One of them is the uh, St. John's Wood site um, there. There's also the Central Synagogue also came out with a booklet about his windows, a very nice, um, uh, good photos. There aren't good photos. You can see my photos here. Thank you, Stephen, for sending me some more photos. But my photos, you know, I just go around with a phone and take pictures, not very well. Uh, the, probably the only really good set of photos are to be found in this book of the Central Synagogue. And we'll move on just a bit more to the artistic content. These are actually your windows in Boreham Wood. I think these may even be your pictures, Stephen. Um, I just chose four of you. You can see Rosh Hashanah here. You can see Ni'ila, which is the end of Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, and again Sukkot. These are his main central themes. Look at his use of words everywhere. And if we look at the second one, Ni'ila, Patach Lanu Shah, Be'et Ni'ila Tashah Ki Yom. You know that from the prayers of Ni'ila on Yom Kippur. Um, he has a lot of Ma'oz Tzu and the Hanukkah pictures. He has a sukkah here. And um, I mean, there is so much. He has a lot of tables and food in his pictures. He has lots of pictures of people blowing a shofar. But he also has abstract pictures of flowers, of birds, which he always said were only flowers and birds which appeared in the Bible or in the Tanakh. Um, here's another set of his five, the Rosh Hashanah set of five from St. John's Wood. Um, in the middle, you see the uh, Tzon, um, Kivakarat, Roe, draw the, the, the sheep going towards the temple above someone blowing a shofar. And on the two side windows, the later windows, uh, people with a talit draped over their heads and either blowing the shofar or, pray, or praying. Um, again, this is the Sukkot set, which we've already looked at. Um, I'm very happy, by the way, because I've got so many of these and I can't show you more than a small amount. People who are interested, this, I'm very happy if you send me emails, I can send you pictures on the email. These are not by in any way my private property and I'm very happy to share the material with you. Central Synagogue, you have these beautiful curved tops with themes, people uh, playing the temple instruments at the top, the harp, um, very uh, intrinsic work. This was probably as a single set. He did them later in the 50s and 60s. Um, he was then at the height of his career and he was doing them specifically for Isaac Wolfson. And these are probably some of his best, uh, um, uh, best sets. You can see the Hanukkah window. That actually is quite a famous window of the man lighting the Hanukkah. I just wanted to show you some of the tops here, the Ten Commandments on Hoshana Rabbah. I'm going to rush through these ones because I don't have time uh, without saying anything about them, just to impress yourself. Yom Kippur. Um, the, some of his windows are signed both in English and Hebrew, which helps us understand how he developed over time. And Shalosh Ragalim Tachogli B'Shana with a picture of the Megillah of Ruth underneath. Pesach, he has a Manishtana. The Higada Talavin Khan, again, the Megillah of Shir Hashirim at the bottom. And the Sukkot, going into the Sukkah, you've already seen that window. Um, let's rush through these Shavuot. This is a very famous window of his, the Hanukkah window. Some of them, he has a man lighting them. And some of them, he has just the Hanukkah by itself. Purim, he has uh, lots on Purim, on Shabbat, on Rosh Chodesh. He has lots of food. Well, I mean, Jews like food. Our festivals are about food. Um, but he's very particular about the foods he has in each phase. No, they're very specific. He doesn't just put them. If you go right up to the window and you look at the way he does the knives and the forks and the chalot and the kiddush cups, as I say, the detail is just amazing in some of them. Rosh Chodesh, Shabbat, I want to come to fear. This is the only time I've seen this theme is actually in St. John's Wood. In St. John's Wood, he obviously had to think of new ideas because he had to do so many. He was a litvak. He wasn't uh, uh, too much into um, ideas of uh, uh, Mashiach and Messiah, but he has a set of windows 
of the messianic era of the wolf lying down with the lamb. But this is exceptional. and You won't find that anywhere else. Um, I think they must be the Terenure ones. And then we come to the story of the faces. Now, overall, <laughs> because of the Ten Commandments and not having a graven image, um, shuls around the world, Orthodox shuls, do not have images, whether they be pictures or stained glass windows, of people with faces. In some, you may get something like this, where faces are covered, or you get the backs of someone, but even then, that's exceptional. He has quite a few like this, but these are the most interesting. And these were right by where I sit in St. John's Wood. So I've had many discussions about them. these are actually Purim windows. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the dates on these windows, they're his very, very, very last windows. About the same time he died, it's possible there were a whole load of windows that were finished off after he died by his daughter in law, Louise Hillman. Um, <laughs> it's possible these were finished off afterwards. Um, but these, this is exceptional. You have a whole frontal face. I don't think you'll find that anywhere else um, in his windows or in orthodox shawls anywhere. Um, again, according to the family, he says he received permission from his brother-in-law, his brother-in-law being the chief rabbi of Israel. Um, again, whether that's the case or not, or whether he was just, it was a Purim window, maybe he was trying out the idea of a Nahafochu, do something different, do something opposite, but this is exceptional to find in an Orthodox synagogue to have full frontal faces on windows. Again, you'll have quite a few of covered faces blowing the shofar. Only in the central synagogue does he have, although he half of his windows were done after the establishment of the State of Israel, his whole family, the Herzogs, the Hillmans, the Rabinuses, were, were Orthodox, but great Zionists, and most of them went to live in Israel. These are the only two windows you will find any um, connection to Israel with the, if you can see, there's a strip of the flag of Israel running up. And at first I missed that for a long time until I eventually uh, suddenly saw it staring out at me from the window. But otherwise you won't find anything to do with the modern state of Israel. Uh, he also, by the way, doesn't have anything to do with the Holocaust except for one small memorial I'll mention just towards the end in a minute or two. Um, looking at the intricacies, he often has people and look how he does it, it's it. You know, it's not just a string, it's the eight strings, the trelet, the blue and white. I mean, this is really intricate work and demands huge amount of time and concentration to get that in. So you need to go in and blow and blow these up. In the St. John's Wood up the top, he has to have others. And there he has some interesting ones. He has sets of flowers, sets of birds, musical instruments that were in the temple. And what I think are two of his... I personally think these are two of the most beautiful windows, but they're not to be found anywhere else. They're upstairs, hidden away in the ladies' gallery in St. John's Wood, and they're two Jerusalem windows. So as that's the nearest to, to you know, having something towards contemporary Israel. But I think these are really nice windows. They're different. And again, Louise Hillman tell, or told me that these were actually completed after his death um, and that the other people allowed themselves some artistic license in, in completing them. I said already he uses full texts, um, and you can see long texts here from the Rosh Hashanah service. And so on and so on. Um, um, huge text he uses throughout. Um, again, I don't know anyone else who uses such long texts. Um, and at the bottom of the windows, these are actually from Boreham Wood um, windows, which are right at the bottom, hidden away behind some of the chairs. I've been focusing on the High Holiday windows, but it's just as true of the other festivals and so on. There are many windows like that. Um, his son, Mickey Hillman, now in his late 80s, tells me, there's a, and he studied architecture as a teenager, he said he used to earn pocket money from his dad by doing some of the lettering um, on the windows um, after school and at weekends. Um, I found some of this, or Mickey Hillman showed me some of this, which is how he prepared the windows. And when I've showed this to professional artists, they say, what, this is how he prepared the window? He didn't start measuring and going and consulting. This is what he did to prepare his windows. He's on a scrap of paper. He wrote more or less the basic pattern, 
Shmona Yimei Chanukah, here he's going to put candles, here he's going to put this. And these were the models. I mean, if you were studying art today, you would get, probably get zero. You would fail your exam for the preparation of your artwork. But this is how Mickey Hillman says he prepared his windows at home and did them by himself. And this is what he worked on. And he has this unfinished window um, at home, the only one unfinished. Now, I want to congratulate, I don't know whether it was you, Stephen, or someone else who thought of the title for tonight of Looking Through the Window. I loved it because there are two windows in St. John's Wood, which when I'm there, together with another person there, Mr. John Friedman, we suddenly discovered a year ago that you can look through the windows. And there are two windows there. One is like this. You're looking through the window and you see a house in Northwest London outside. But what's more surprising is the following one. It's more like looking at Christmas through the window. We don't quite know how it came to be, why he did it. He obviously in some of his windows um, had a sense of uh, humor, which he wanted to try out on people. But there are these windows where you look at the window and you look further on through the window afterwards. Just this past year, 50 years after they originally were instigated, St. John's Wood decided to clean their windows. Um, and, and you can see the before and the after. The before they had this transparent film over them. Unfortunately, St. John's Wood is surrounded by lots of other buildings. So the sun often doesn't come through. And they were cleaned. And this is what they looked after literally just a few months ago. And they look absolutely magnificent when they're being cleaned. Um, you either need light, so you need good sunlight coming through to really appreciate them. Um, I'm coming towards the end. I realize I've overstayed uh, my time. This is the only window. It's a small window um, upstairs in St. John's Wood, which has a monument, uh, has some words um, in memory of the uh, six million who were slaughtered in the Holocaust, but that's the only time he has it. Um, and he has one in honor of his father, Avi, Rabbi, Mori, Hagaon, Shmuel, Yitzhak, Hilman, my father, my rabbi, my teacher, um, the genius, Shmuel, Yitzhak, Hilman, um, the Rosh Bet Din of London, the head of the Bet Din of London, Mechaber Or Hayashah, he brought out a series of books called Or Hayashah, which just recently Rabbi Pini Duna, some of you may remember from London, is now in Beverly Hills, and was just this week here in Israel. He, together with Buzi Herzog, the head of the Jewish agency, um, funded a new copy together with Hillman's biography. Uh, this is the only one to his father, and this is the one to his wife who predeceased him by six years. It was dedicated by her husband, David Hillman, by his three sons and two of his daughters-in-law. His third son was not yet married at the time. But they're the only uh, memories of him on the windows itself. He was eventually elected a member of the British Society of Master Glass Painters, as was obviously very well deserved. And he died in 1974 and is buried in Bushy Cemetery. And you can see an example of his signature at the top. I could speak for hours and hours and hours. I will stop there and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have on this topic. Thank you. D David, thank you very much indeed. Um, if I can use the word illuminating, um, just very, very interesting. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned um, about windows being lit up. The windows in Boreham Wood um, are lit up I from agree. behind, but rather poorly. Um, so you don't really get the full okay. grand grandeur of, yeah. of the window. Um, but I, I wanted to um, ask you um, a specific question. You mentioned that from the set from Bayswater, um, three are missing. You mentioned the, the Purim window, which is in Ely Cathedral. What, what's happened to the other two, do you know? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. There is a place where some windows are stored and I've been trying to get to go and see them, but for some reason or other people don't want me to. <laughs> um, or I haven't been able to. I know that uh, others are stored there, like the Bronzebury ones. Um, the only thing that someone who knows a little about it, a little bit about it, said that there were three windows, he says, that took a walk. One to Eli Cathedral, and I haven't been able to find much more about the, um, about the other two. It would be interesting uh, to find out whether they got lost, whether they're in storage, or whether someone has a beautiful basement in his house in Northwest London, mm -hmm. adorned by a David Hillman window. Can I add something? Uh, I'm Greg Lander. Um, uh, when I was involved in getting the windows to Boreham Wood, 
And I was always told there are only two missing windows, one of which wasn't allowed to come to Bora Wood because it was in memory of a family member. And we never knew what happened to either of them. So I'm very interested to hear that you say there were three. No, it's Is very that possible that the one to Eli Cathedral was something that was arranged with the United Synagogue. So it could be the other two. Um, it, it, that's a possibility. It, it, I'm not sure in terms of the numbers that there are three missing. Are they recorded? One of them is Purim. Yeah, the Purim one is the one at Eli oh. Cathedral. Simchas Torah, uh, sorry. Simchas Torah. Simcha 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 the woman who donated it refused to give it over to me. I was responsible. Oh, okay. I was chairman of the rabbinical council at the time, and we managed to get them from Bayswater to be stored. And I asked them for the set, and they refused point blank. She said to me, she gave them, she wants it back. So that oh, was... that's interesting. Rabbi Plancy, when I'm next in London after COVID, I'm coming to speak to you about how they came, the, the history of how they came from Bayswater to Devorimor. What happened was, as the chairman, I was very lucky. I mean, even the seats I managed to find, once the shoals are closing, uh, I put in a deal, and uh, I said, we want them. They were put into storage because they had to be repaired, some of them, when they yeah. took them out. Greg will tell you, we had to get some of them completely cleaned, etc. But they were put into storage until the shul was actually built. And then they were put into the order that they were put into. You'll see them. And then you go around to the minor festivals, Chanukah, uh, Purim. You've got Shabbos, which is also in the minor festivals. As it happens, there was no more room for any more windows. So okay. it was actually a big muzzle. That she said, <laughs> <I'm outside. laughs> uh, that, would be, uh, that would be the problem of an Israeli shul, because most Israeli shuls, with one or two exceptions, are very small, yeah. But I'm surprised with the seal, with the signatures, because it was put in very, very carefully. No, you can see, you can see, you can see the Hillman signature on most of the windows. Yeah, and the other yeah. reason why it was put into a case is because you're living in Boreham Wood, you never know what, who's going to come along. If it's an outside window, could be smashed. We wanted to make sure that they were preserved because of who they were and where they came from. Yeah, and remember the light boxes are thirty odd years old. Yeah, and new yeah. lighting technology which could greatly improve the system. I mean, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's absolutely. The, the way for someone to really appreciate the art of these windows is really, in a sense, to do them in one of the shawls and even have a year long series, one a month, just talking about one window each month because there's so much in them. But you would have to be able to have them lit up um, effectively each time. The whole purpose of having the windows is to get tradition together with modernity. It was a modern shul, as you can see the shape of it, and we wanted to bring something back from the history of Anglo Jewry, which is actually very important. We should know there's a past, a present, and we hope there will be a future. Thank and you, you and you have the Glasgow connection. I have indeed. And in <laughs> fact, we're related to the Wolstons as well. Uh -oh. Charles's uh, grandson is married to my wife's cousin. <laughs> There you go. Robert Plants and Greg Lander, thank you very much. Are there any um, uh, other questions yeah, that you'd I like to ask a professor? Question. I have a question, David. This is Ian Rowe speaking. I grew up in Crickwood, Warm Lane, where obviously the whole building was covered with these beautiful windows. There was one particular window on the west wall, the Anaharis Bovo, which is shown on the inside back cover of Peter Renton's book. And for me, um, great memory is that the way the way the light would shine through that window on Yom Kippur afternoon around Ne'ila time was just something very very magical what where I, I believe that went to Pinna but I'm not mentioning that yeah, I, well I've not heard of any being in Pinna I know the Cricklewood windows were sort of shared out um the most of them went to Bronsbury as I said the front windows went to Kent and there must have been a, a, a good number in Cricklewood and two Ooh. or three actually went to Hendon Riley Close. Um, if there's anyone listening to me today who has pictures of the windows in the old shawls in Cricklewood, in Bayswater, in New Cross, um, perhaps uh, Rabbi Plancy or Greg, you have pictures of them in Bayswater before they were transferred. I would love to see those because I've never seen them. Why did they get to Cricklewood, some of his earlier windows? Um, Cricklewood was being built at the time again. Louis Rabinowitz was his brother-in-law. So I'm sure that was also part of where these windows went to certain shawls and not to other shawls. Well, I was told that he actually lived there in the area at the time. That's how they came. Yeah, he lived in, 
he lived in Priory Road, and uh, right. the Rabinowitz family at the time, my grandfather was the rabbi in Notting Hill, Louis Rabinowitz was the rabbi in Cricklewood, right. uh, he lived in St John's Wood, so actually that wasn't too far away from each other, and they used to visit each other the whole time, and that was their mover, that was their area of movement. So Thank where you. did that window end up? Does anybody know? I know, uh, you know, assuming that all the Cricklewood windows went to one of those three locations, it will be in one of those three locations, but uh, you'd have it's to go and look or go through the pictures to see which right, place. It's definitely not in Kenton because I moved to Kenton and lived there and, and I remember that, that display very, very clearly. I always personally felt it was a bit of an overkill putting the whole lot together in one go. By the way, I think uh, I think it would be great if um, a serious art critic um, came and did a good story about the Hillman windows. I think they need to be known by and to the wider public, um, and they need to be known to the Jewish public, but even to the wider public, because as I say, I think they're a, a, a tremendous heritage. Indeed. Um, are there any more questions for, for Professor Newman? Okay, um, David, thank you very much indeed. It's been an amazing talk and an amazing evening. Um, I guess um, I've learned so much. Uh, as I say, I look at the windows every time I, I'm in shul. That doesn't happen very often, I'm afraid, at the moment. But please, God, um, we will all return to our shuls. Um, and um, those of us who have the uh, are lucky enough to have the Hillman windows, um, can really enjoy them and, and look at them in a completely different light. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening and giving oh, us... Very my pleasure and I hope that when COVID is over I'll be back uh, to work on the Jewish archives in London and to visit some of the shuls and, um, and to find out every time you go and look at one of these windows you find out something new. You'll be very welcome in Borehamwood. Look forward to seeing you. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you and, and good Bye, evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Yeah, I've said to put it on to applause. It wasn't my name, was it? Okay. I couldn't. Thank you, Professor Newman. Thank you, Stephen. Pleasure, Rabbi. Fascinating talk. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I want to close, since Rabbi Chapa's back on at the very end, I want to close with something very relevant. And Rabbi Chapa was the rabbi at the Ilford Federation. One of my little projects is I try and bring unused Sifre Torah to Israel for use by new young communities. And one of the one of the Sifre Torah I brought was from Ilford Federation, which Rabbi Chapa was very helpful in helping me bring here. And it just happens to be the same Sefer Torah which we have been using, which I am um, in my own particular garden minyan over the last few weeks during COVID. And wow. just this weekend, I read my Bar Mitzvah parasha, Matot Masay, from that very Sefer Torah. Wow, incredible, fantastic. Really, really so pleased to hear it's being used. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank, Thank you again. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye. I'll turn out another. He's got. Okay, I've turned off now. No, but he was at. I know William Rhodes because I'm on the top of the list. I'm on the top of the list. Okay, they can't hear me now, but he's gone now, Jeffrey.